Welcome our Congress International Panel with host Dan Maddox and special guest. From the United Kingdom, Chair of the Chartered Institute of Payroll Professionals, CIPP, Michelle Crook. From South Africa, Vice Chair, the South African Payroll Association, SAPA, Lavintra Terry Persad. From Canada, Chairman of the Canadian Payroll Association, CPA, Marie Lynn Dion, CPM. And from Australia, Senior Payroll SME at the Association for Payroll Specialists, Jason Lowe. Give a round of applause. This is the first time we've done an international panel, and, and I think you're, you're going to really enjoy it. We're going to start with the first question, and it's for all four of you. Tell us a bit about your organization, um, about the history and why you were founded, and something that's unique about your organization. And I'm going to start with you, Michelle. Okay. Dan, you might regret asking. It's been a bit of a journey. <laughs> The Association of Pensions and Superannuation Administrators, nice short name, was formed pre-1980 when George Powell from Liverpool in the UK wrote a letter to the local government association. His words, not mine, he was pissed off that he's, he was always the poor relation to the accountants. They got all the glory for all of his hard work and he wanted us to do something about it. Soon after ACTA started, Gordon Creswell, who's a founder member of the association, was contacted by contacted by a non-government organisation who wanted to join. And those sort of government uh, organisation representatives said, no, thank you, we don't want the private sector uh, interfering. Despite best efforts, uh, a separate association uh, was set up. Gordon and a fellow committee member, Peter Blackhurst, joined forces to form the British Payroll Managers Association. Good or bad, APSA sort of fell into some financial difficulties and came to the, the BPMA to ask if they could merge, which was quite good. We were changed to the payroll and pensions management um, following the merger. We then, so it's a long story. We became the Institute of Payroll Professionals in 2007, as it was felt by the members our previous title alienated some of the. Uh, the administrators that weren't managers, and our final change in 2010 we became a chartered association when we got a royal charter. We've got um, just over 10,000 members from the, uh, benefiting from the support that we provide. And as far as the uniqueness, I would say it's the people that, that work for the association, from Lindsay as a CEO to Brad as now as a, an apprentice. Whether they're based at head office or remote workers, they just display such a passion for, for payroll, the association and the industry that I'm really proud of them. Terrific. Levine. Okay, um, uh, SAPA was formed in 1999 by uh, a Mr. Dave Theron, uh, who was a software payroll um, owner. He actually, uh, this, uh, he sparked off SAPA through his association with the UK, because he was actually interacting with the UK payroll, uh, and this is where he got the idea. So SAPA has been in existence for 16 years, uh, with the sole purpose to serve as a residing over issues that affected payroll professionals. Um, we've come a really long way. We have now been prof uh, become a professional body in two, um, 2013. And um, we have um, actually um, now, um, we have started doing exciting conferences, uh, workshops, um, a professionalization of our membership, and our members are really growing. Um, I think if you um, talk about why we um, unique, um, I would say that we uh, have the same common goals uh, that all the other associations have, and that is to, you know, the purpose is to give value proposition to our, our membership. Um, the, the, there's one thing that I would say we are a little bit different in, in that we do not have a strong financial arm um, to support us. So we, um, and revenue generating it does become a problem. So I would say that's a limiting issue for us. Um, however, in terms of what we do for members, um, we give them a great benefit and membership fees is really, uh, it equates to the, uh, the benefits that's given. So in that way, I think we, we're slightly different. We do conferences um, regionally in our three main cities in our country. 
So we take the conferences to our members rather than having one Congress where everybody, uh, everybody comes along. So I, I say in that way, we are a bit different. Thanks. Well, great. And go ahead, give a round of applause, because I know you wanted to. <laughs> Melly Lynn. Dan, would you like me to answer in French or in English? Um, probably English would be best. OK, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> The Canadian Payroll Association was founded in 1978 and is the first payroll association in the world. At that time, the objectives were uh, payroll knowledge and professionalism, influencing payroll leg legislation, and providing education and research programs. Today, we have these objectives uh, through our mission, which is payroll leadership through advocacy and education. Um, the, to the, those objectives are our value, our community, professionalism, and compliance knowledge. Payroll compliance is our core activity. We now have 14,000 payroll practitioners in a membership of 20,000 members. Terrific, thank you. Jason. Uh, Dan, before I answer your question, I actually owe you an apology. I, I owe all of you an apology. In fact, um, I, I've spent very little time at Congress so far this year. Uh, and you know how it is, Dan. You get that phone call where they say, look, someone's called in sick. We really need your help. So unfortunately, I haven't spent any time at Congress yet. I've been uh, too busy working with the thunder from down under. <laughs> You can see me tonight at eight at the Tropicana. Um, so, no, it's the Excalibur, isn't it? The Excalibur. Um, about TAPS, uh, TAPS is a little different to the other associations. We're actually a privately owned organisation. Uh, the company was started by my father, so it used to be a family business. Um, he was a salesperson all his career. He'd sold everything from photocopiers to cars to houses, uh, and he took a job selling payroll software. Uh, and everyone he went to visit to uh, sell payroll software, he, they said, no, we don't need any payroll software, but what we really need is some help um, understanding the payroll legislation. And he said, I see an opportunity here. So he uh, started the association. He's uh, since retired. Uh, he sold us uh, about eight years ago to uh, NGA Human Resources. And although we're owned by a payroll software company, we still act very independently and behave like uh, an association very much like um, the APA and my friends here on the, the table. And I'm very excited to say that this year is our 25th anniversary. Excellent. <laughs> okay, second question. Currently, what are the two biggest challenges for payroll professionals in your country? And I'm gonna start with you, Michelle. Okay, look, I would say the first one is finding the right people. In my opinion, working in payroll takes a certain sort of person, somebody that can deal with the fact that the only phone call they ever take is from an unhappy employee, one that can drop everything at the end of the day because payroll takes over and, and their personal plans take second place, and appreciates that whilst a bank holiday is fantastic, actually, do you know what, it plays havoc with payroll timetables. Um, I think all of our associations play a great part in this by ensuring that we're offering training and, and qualifications for our industries, and it means Certainly, if I see a CIPP qualification on a, on a UK resume, that's 50% of the work done for me, um, and, and it at least gets somebody an interview. The second challenge would probably be dealing with the, the sort of near 200 pieces of legislation that we deal with. Probably the two biggest changes that we've had to leg legislation have come in the last two years, and the changes themselves weren't the issue because we're payroll people. Do you know what? We just deal with it. It was the the fact that the, the government in the UK decided they could make a fundamental change to the pension system, meaning that as payrollers that have not really been involved in pensions, we suddenly got to auto-enrol and put all of our staff into, into pension schemes. They also introduced something called real-time information, which is real-time filing with the revenue, going from filing once a year to filing every pay period. On, on their own, not a problem, but the fact that they introduced them together was a bit of a headache for for payroll, um, payrollers, but a bigger headache for software providers. And I suppose the, the, the other issue that we've got, since the start of the year in the UK, we've sort of had political parties all over the place. We've got a uh, general election tomorrow, could mean a change of government at the end of tomorrow, and in which case, who knows what legislation could come in from, 
from later this year. Okay, thank you. Levine. Okay, I think um, uh, the South African economy, um, we really uh, have huge challenges in terms of our payroll professional currently, and that's driven by the economic climate as well as the labor unrest currently. Um, and um, we as payroll professionals are directly impacted by what's happening in the economy. Uh, if I have to start off with um, the, the very first issue is globalization. And um, currently, the trend in the business environment is for us to downsize in, uh, in, Afri in South Africa and grow into Africa. Um, and you find that the businesses have been starting to cut uh, businesses in, uh, in, Af uh, in South Africa, uh, growing into Africa, and that brings a huge set of challenges for us as pro payroll professionals. So, um, and the first challenge would be um, the IT technology because we struggle in, in Africa um, to have uh, proper IT uh, infrastructure and uh, we find that especially if you're running a shared services environment, you have network issues, you cannot connect into Africa. Um, the other issue is um, legislation. We really, really battle to uh, have information at hand. Um, that gives us a comprehensive set of guidelines as to how to work with the African legislation. Um, uh, and payroll professionals struggle through, uh, through that, uh, understanding what is the requirement. Um, the other thing is the, the language barriers. Um, I've just recently been working with Angola, and it's a predominant, predominantly um, Portuguese-based uh, language. Um, and I've had to have a translator translating um, the, the, the tax tables and the legislation. So that's been a huge challenge for me. Um, and and the, uh, the other thing, without offending any payroll vendor here, I've yet to see uh, a payroll system that can give us uh, one system that we can operate throughout um, globally um, uh, seamlessly with uh, differing uh, tax legislation. Um, if anybody has that here on the floor, please let me know. I'll be happy to look at that. <laughs> so so, so that, that is a, a huge challenge. Um, the other challenge that we have is um, with, in South Africa, we find that with the sale of businesses, uh, our payroll professionals now um, need to really become business people and skilled at business skills rather than just payroll. Uh, I've recently had an experience of um, uh, my company selling off two businesses where I was involved in uh, the sale of this business uh, as a Section 197 company. So um, it, this means that you would sell off the business with um, all your conditions of employment going across uh, exactly the same. And um, the challenge was that um, I, as a payroll person or payroll manager, had to um, do this completely and run it as a project and as a, as a business person. So I had to look at the systems, uh, I had to do the needs analysis of what was the requirements. Um, I had to um, resource the structure of the department, resource the department. And um, it, it was quite critical because the suspensive condition of the sale was that payroll had to work. And so for me, it gave me the, the feeling of how important a payroll function is in an environment, a business environment. And um, the CEOs were looking at it and saying, um, so what's happening? Are we getting paid? Are you going to have everything up and running? And uh, you know, uh, I had to also start from scratch with setting up business um, benefit structures and putting equivalent structures in place so the employees had the same medical aids and retirement funds that they had in an in-house scheme. Um, in, in an open market scheme. Uh, so it's various challenges and, and it was quite an exciting experience um, to be doing this. And uh, from, for me, it's saying, you know, we payroll professionals really need to um, get up in our game and we need to be just more than payroll people uh, in, in the environment and the market because the market is really um, asking us for much more. Terrific, thank you. Marilyn. Um, according to our member census, uh, of, we received 8,500 8, response. Uh, the biggest challenge for them is the inconsistency of legislation uh, within the, prov the different provinces and also the increase in complexity of the payroll. And 
Another challenge for the association itself is that we provide compliance services in both uh, official languages, French and English. So uh, to help you to understand that, Dan, I will teach you two French has a payroll terms. As everyone knows, payroll must provide pay statement to each employee every pay. The French translation for the pay, for the pay statement is bulletin de pay. The summary of every payroll run is the payroll register. In French is registre de pay. Because I'm a teacher, and I know that students need to restate to learn, so Dan, now repeat after me. <laughs> pay statement. Le teacher, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> Means, give me the check, please. Um, okay. Pay statement <laughs> is bulletin de pay. 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 Exact. <laughs> Payroll register is. Registre de pay. Registre. Registre. Registre de pay. pay. Registre de pay. Exactly. Excellent. You pass. <laughs> that was Merci. scary. <laughs> Merci. Merci de la part de l'Association canadienne de la paix. Did she just say something awful? <laughs> <laughs> I said thank you. <laughs> Jason. Um, our two issues, first of all, uh, compliance remains the, the biggest issue, and the consequences for not complying are getting uh, increasingly more severe in Australia. We have some new legislation uh, which they refer to as accessorial liability. Uh, so if you are an accessory to helping your company um, not be compliant, you can be held personally liable. Uh, and we uh, recently had our very first case around this. Uh, there was a, a, you know, a medium-sized organisation uh, who operated in 10 locations uh, throughout uh, Australia and they had been deliberately underpaying the employees. Uh, not only was the business fined, but the payroll manager for helping in this process uh, received a personal fine of $10,000. So um, very important that we remain compliant in Australia. Um, our second issue is um, around um, a new government initiative, uh, which they're calling One Touch Payroll. We don't like the word, we prefer uh, One Touch Payment. Um, but we have a very good system of paying our employees in Australia. Everyone, probably 99% of the population, is paid electronically direct into their personal bank accounts. Um, they would like to expand that to this One Touch Payroll system, where at the end of the payroll process, in theory, you push one button, uh, and then the employees get paid, the money gets sent to the tax office automatically, money gets sent to child support automatically, uh, money gets sent through to, to pensions automatically. So we're just uh, starting that process now with the government, so it's very interesting. And I'd like to end, Dan, with maybe teaching you some Australian, uh, <laughs> since... Um, <laughs> uh, try this one. G'day, mate. G'day, mate. <laughs> okay, Lovely good. Word. Okay, I'm going to end with this a question individually to each one of you. So I'm going to ask you, Michelle, that if there was a U.S. company that you would be outrageously interested in learning more about their payroll operations, what company would that be, why, and then we're going to see if we can hook you up. Okie doke. <laughs> I think it would probably have to be Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sort of understand there have been some difficulties recruiting staff to run the UK arm of the payroll, so I'd like to know a little bit more about that. And I also feel I've contributed so much to Starbucks over the years. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be a shareholder. <laughs> okay, cool. I think we can hook you up. Do we have anybody here from Starbucks? <laughs> okay, for Levine. Um, you've been to the US several times, and if you were to live in the US, what city would you pick to live in? Uh, definitely Nevada, and the reason is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so on a taxability standpoint, did she pick a good place to live? Yes, yeah, she did. Great. Okay, for Marilyn. Well, first of all, what I want to, she pointed out to you that her first language is French, and this is a story that just cracks me up. Last year, we were in the UK, and she and her husband were in France before we met in the UK, and it was their first time in France, first time in Paris, and they went to Versailles, 
and they wanted to take a tour, and there are no French-speaking tours at Versailles, <laughs> or really anywhere in France. So it's sort of like going to Mount Vernon, and there's no English-speaking tours. And I, that story just cracks me up. So the question that I have for you is, you've been to Vegas before, right? No, it's Oh, you haven't? Time. Okay. Well, who do you think is your favorite Las Vegas performer? My name is Dion. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say Celine, but I'm not her sister, I'm not a cousin, but we share the same ancestor. <laughs> She's not from Vegas. <laughs> okay, Jason. How many people have been to Australia before? It's an amazing place. How many people do business with Australia? Your company has some interface with Australia. Australia is the sweetest place to live. You start off with something like three months annual vacation. And then you work up from there. And at this point, Jason has like nine months annual vacation. So when he comes to the US, he's, sometime, he's often here longer than I am. Um, so what I want to ask you, Jason, is what do you love most about the U.S. and what do you dislike most about the U.S.? And I can't be the answer to either one of those questions. <laughs> uh, I suppose the thing I love the most is the people. Uh, and the other thing, you said you spent a lot of money at uh, Starbucks. I spent a lot of money at McDonald's. <laughs> Uh, the thing I like uh, least about the US, and I'm used to it now, uh, but tipping. We don't tip in Australia, so uh, it's very odd for me everywhere I go to have to hand out money. So, um, <laughs> do I have to tip you, Dan, on the way out, or? No, not this time. All right, okay. <laughs> what do you love the most? The oh, people, McDonald's? The people. The people at McDonald's. Oh, I think at McDonald's Shake in Shack. Australia, though. Have you been to Shake Shack? Shake Shack? No, I don't need to oh. Shake Shack. Oh, it's good. <laughs> okay, let's give Michelle, Levine, Melanie Lynn, and Jason a big round of applause for our international panel. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you very much. Oh, you're so, so good. So much. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you.